Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is really my honor to introduce this session. As Petra said, we're going to continue on the very important theme of nutrient quality. Um, now we're looking at it from a different lens of application in product development, um, which, as I'm sure you can appreciate, is a very uh, complex and multifaceted topic. And uh, with our three distinguished speakers, um, we'll try to hope to tackle different aspects of it, uh, from looking at ways of um, uh, ranking products based on their overall uh, nutrient composition. Uh, we're going to then look into different ways of um, defining nutrient quality uh, using clinical biomarkers and clinical intervention, um, taking carbohydrates an, as an example. And finally, we're going to wrap up the session with um, a very interesting topic of uh, plant bioactives as an example of non-nutritive uh, dietary constituents. So I hope the session gives you a very nice blend of insights. Um, I suggest, that, as you see, the topics are quite interrelated, so I suggest that we save our questions till the end. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have a generous amount of time for a panel discussion, and I look forward to a very engaging and stimulating conversation. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. Um, he is a thought leader in the field of nutrient profiling. Uh, Professor Adam Dernowski is the director of the Center for Public Health Nutrition and Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Washington, Seattle. Adam. Good afternoon, everyone. My presentation has to do with nutrient profiling and specifically with the use of nutrient profiling methods to improve nutrient density, sustainability, and affordability of foods. So the title alone gives you some idea that there are various components or aspects to sustainability. And in fact, there are four dimensions. What you see on the right is my paraphrase of the definition put together by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I say sustainable, healthy diets need to be nutrient-rich, affordable, socially and culturally acceptable, and with low impact on the environment. So there are, in fact, four domains. Nutrition, economics, society, and the environment. And actually, they correspond to the four domains that Isabel talked about this morning. It is exactly the same thing. We're looking at nutrition, prices and affordability, environmental impact in packaging, and, of course, taste, aroma, and pleasure. And I will make reference to three recent reports from the FAO. The first one is on sustainable, healthy diets. The second one is on affordable nutrient density. And the third one is on nutrition relevant function functional unit for life cycle analyses. So each of those domains has its own metrics and measures. And you will see that all four domains involve nutrient profiling in some way. So for nutrient density, we can look at nutrients per 100 grams, 100 calories, or per serving. Affordability is measured in terms of calories or nutrients per penny, sometimes in relation to prevailing wages. Environmental costs I'll come to discuss in greater detail, but the functional unit is the issue. And then I've been working on all those aspects of nutrient profiling, with the exception of one I'm trying to develop a measure of maximum nutrients per unit of pleasure. So this is the combination of pleasure, enjoyment, and nutrient composition of foods. So four domains, not two. Sometimes you go from nutrition to the environment. Society and economics are extremely important. But let's go back to nutrient profiling. So I'll tell you what people don't tell you. There's always a purpose behind nutrient profiling. It is done for a reason. And nutrient profiling is meant to assist in the implementation of dietary guidelines. And dietary guidelines address specific health issues. So in high-income countries, the major health issues are going to be overweight and obesity and non-communicable diseases. And the dietary recommendations are to reduce calories, fat, sugar, and salt. 
and not by coincidence. It is designed that way. Nutrient profiles penalize foods for having excess calories, fat, sugar, and salt. The first question for discussion later on is whether this framework is suitable for use in low- and middle-income countries where nutrient deficiencies and inadequacies are still common. So this is the first question to discuss. And then notice on the right, and these are examples from NutriScore, which is being used in the European Union, notice that the highest nutritional quality is given to plain water. Huh. And NutriScore is not alone in this, because on the next slide, you see foods on the left, which are th typically thought of as nutrient-dense or nutrient-rich foods. So you see fresh produce and dairy products and beans and lean meats and seafood and so on. And in fact, many of these are picked up in the dietary guidelines. But what you see on the right is the latest edition of the dietary guidelines for Americans, where nutrient density is conceptualized as the absence of calories, fat, sugar, and salt. So as a result, and this is taken from the dietary guidelines, what you see on the right as an example of a nutrient-dense food is sparkling water. So you could say, ah, the most nutrient-rich food we produce is San Pellegrino. Our job is done. But you know and I know that that is incorrect. So in fact, I'm taking a very different view of nutrient density. It is not the absence of problematic nutrients. It is the presence of positive beneficial nutrients. You notice I'm avoiding the use of good and bad because that does, does not really correspond to nutritional reality. So what are the uses of nutrient profiling? Another good question. Nutrient profiling began <clears throat> actually in Europe because the European Parliament was looking at authorizing um, nutrition and health claims, and those were only to be given to foods with a favorable nutrient profile. So initial uses of nutrient profiling were to be educational, regulatory, front of pack labeling, and so on. But in fact, nutrient profiling got another life because it became adopted by the food industry to benchmark product reformulation. And I think the most important applications of nutrient profiling to public health are in fact the industrial uses, not the shelf labels, not the food labels, not even the front of pack labels. I think nutrient profiling has been invaluable for benchmarking product reformulation by the food industry. The problem is that nutrient profiling models such as they are right now are not as yet equal to the task, and we need innovations in nutrient profiling to make sure that the industry innovations and renovations are properly captured by our nutrient profiling methods. And sometimes they are, but often they are not. So let me focus for now on nutrient profiling for product development and product formulation and reformulation. First big point, Food formulation and reformulation is not the same as food processing. There is a big difference between processing engineering and formulation engineering. I'm not going to go into the issue of foods that fall into the ultra-processed category, but keep in mind formulation and processing are very separate, and there is nothing wrong with processing, and there are a number of ways in which reformulation can improve nutrient density of foods. So then the next three points. Most approaches to product reformulation have to do with subtraction or removal of calories, fat, trans fat, sugar, and salt. But there is more to it. In my approach, I say formulation and product development can involve subtraction, addition, and innovation. Those are three separate things. For addition, you have enrichment and fortification. You have addition of wholesome ingredients to foods. And when it comes to innovation, there's just so much more new ingredients, plant-based proteins, bioavailability, precision fermentation, all those things come into product reformulation. Does nutrient profiling address those at this time? Actually not. Nutrient profiling is very good right now at judging foods based on energy, fat, sugar, and sodium. 
not every model actually includes positive beneficial nutrients. So let me go just a little bit into the mechanics of nutrient profiling. You've all seen these. These are the guidelines daily amounts, and they started with calories, sugar, fat, and so on. Notice how they began neutral. About six or seven years ago, same color, all the nutrients were equal. Then they became traffic lights, green, amber, and red. And then they became huge, big, black warning signs in Chile and now in Mexico, again looking at calories, saturated fat, sugar, and sodium. And notice in Mexico, they also talk about low-calorie sweeteners. So these are the warning signs focusing on problematic nutrients. But the nutrient profile I want to talk about is the composite nutrient profile. So these are the composite methods which have been used in front of pack labels. And those methods aim to capture the overall nutrient density, that is the healthfulness of foods. So foods are rated or ranked based on their overall nutritional value. And then nutrient profiling models can be across the board. The same criteria applied to every food group, or they can be category specific. Now, if you apply an across the board model to a nutrient composition database, you will notice that spinach is healthier than cookies, but you knew that. So industry actually prefers to have category specific models where you look for the best pizza in a category, the best cereal in a category. There's no point comparing cereals to spinach. What is the best nutrient rich cereal within the category of cereals? So there are many advantages to category specific models. And then you have models which are based on what I call problematic nutrients or nutrients of concern, models based on positive nutrients, protein, fiber, vitamins, minerals, almost often some combination of both. So this is a model which I developed some time ago. I'm just showing it as an example. This is a compensatory model. It is based on nine nutrients to encourage, protein, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. There are nutrients to limit, saturated fat, added sugar, and sodium. The algorithm is extremely simple. It is out in the public domain, and you take percent daily values for the nutrients to encourage. You take the daily values for nutrients to limit, the sum of nutrients to encourage minus the sum of nutrients to limit. That's it. We're done. Very simple. As I say, it is in the public domain, and for that reason, it has been used quite often. Notice it is not recent. That publication goes back to 2008. And of course, in developing this model, we went through every permutation of nutrients, positive and negative and minerals and so on, and looked at the one that gave us the best correlation with an independent of a measure of a healthy diet. Again, in nutrient profiling, having more nutrients is not an advantage. The fewer, the better. They need to be discriminating but actually fewer nutrients, the better, because in some cases, especially outside North America in Europe, nutrient composition databases are limited. So this is how things come out. Uh, you go essentially from sugar to spinach or soft drinks to spinach. This is a plot showing energy density on the vertical axis, nutrient density on the horizontal axis. And notice that there is no line that says good foods to the right, bad foods to the left. It is a continuum. And within each food group, such as grains, there are products which are relatively more nutrient-rich and products which are relatively less nutrient-rich. This is done with a small database. I just repeated that with a huge big database for close to 7,000 foods, FNDDS 2015. And again, take a look. Sugar-sweetened beverages, sugar-sweet bakery goods, snacks and sweets to the left, fresh produce, and fortified ready-to-eat cereals, processed foods to the right, and this is nutrient density plotted against energy density, and the size of the bubble corresponds to the number of items in a database. The database has got 6,581 foods. This is the one that is used for what we eat in America studies. So let's now compare two systems, the nutrient-rich food index on the left and the Nutri-score point system on the right. The one on the left is a continuous system. The one on the right is a point system with thresholds. The system on the left does not have thresholds. The one on the right does. The elements are similar. 
Notice fiber and protein are in both, and saturated fat, added sugar, and sodium are in both. Nutri-score has total sugar, and Nutri-score has energy as a negative component. I don't, because nutrient-rich food index is calculated per 100 calories. Nutri-score is calculated per 100 grams. But there are similarities and differences, because in the nutrient-rich food index, a high score is good, in Nutri-score, the high score is bad. So as a result, the two are inversely linked. And because Nutri-score has got calories and saturated fat and total sugar, it is, of course, correlated with energy density very highly. So my point is, why not just use energy density and call it a day? Why have a nutrient profiling system, which is basically a transform of energy density and nothing else? And so this is um, analysis of 641 plant-based milk alternatives in one of the USDA databases, which show you Nutri-score and energy density on the left, and the inverse relationship between Nutri-score points and the nutrient-rich score on the right. Notice on the right that there are a number of items which have the same exact score on Nutri-score but very different scores are nutrient-rich. And that is because of fortification, because those plant-based milks are fortified with calcium and vitamin A and vitamin D, and in some cases, vitamin B12. And nutrient-rich food index takes care of that and does give extra points or extra value. Nutri-score does not. So in fact, Nutri-score, to my mind, is going to be very ill-suited for anything that has to do with nutrient-rich, um, nutrient rich um, nutrient concerns or requirements in low- and middle-income countries. So how do we use nutrient profiling models for product development? I've already dealt with saturated fat, sodium, and sugar as the nutrients to limit. For protein, we need to look at protein quality. The nutrients to encourage are typically protein and fiber, and then the vitamins and minerals their choice may depend on specific nutrient needs of a given country. So for example, in the US, we have calcium, vitamin D as potassium as potential nutrients of concern. In other countries, it is going to be iron and zinc and vitamin A and iodine. So you can actually mix and match the nutrients to correspond to the needs of a specific location. And then there are some um, preliminary experimental nutrient density scores, which combine both nutrients and food groups. For example, we can do a score of carbohydrates. John will talk about those, which blends nutrients together with whole grain content of the product. So it's a combination of nutrients and ingredients. So nutrient profiling methods can be used to product development. Couple more points. One is when we come to nutrient quality of protein, I have been using PDCAS, which is the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. And notice that PDCAS for animal products is very different from plant based proteins. When you do a PDCAS correction, take a look at the figures on the right the seeds and nuts and the plants move to the left. Legumes do not, but fish and beef and pork and chicken and meats really are not affected at all. Um, the plant-based meat alternatives usually have about 15, almost exactly 15 grams of protein per 100 grams. Generally, that protein needs to be concentrated and comes from multiple plant sources uh, for um, maximum effectiveness. A um, couple of things here about the affordability. Um, daily value of protein per 100 grams on the vertical axis, notice that the highest in protein content are going to be the meat products, obviously, but look at the difference in cost. Shellfish to the right, chicken to the left, the affordability of high quality protein is a big issue. It's what you see on the vertical axis is protein content, on the horizontal axis, logarithmic scale food cost, using the latest food prices from the United States Department of Agriculture. So just a few words about nutrient profiling and affordable nutrition. 
take a look at the figure at the bottom, we would like to eat the foods on the right, look at the differential in cost, it's pretty much tenfold. And this is not something that US dietary guidelines have come to grips with, because look at the salmon and the blueberries and the greenhouse tomatoes and so on, on the cover of the dietary guidelines of Americans. To give them credit, the FAO has been very, very vocal about affordable nutrient density for all. And such affordable nutrient density may actually involve processed foods. So here, very small point, diets of starchy staples, pure calories are very cheap, diets which are nutrient adequate are more expensive, and diets which are healthy and obey social norms are more expensive still. So in fact, the social norms are expensive to fulfill. Calories are cheap, nutrients are expensive, satisfying the, ex the norms is more expensive yet. One final thing about sustainability, I'll just move directly into nutrient profiling for estimating the environmental cost of foods. The latest report from the FAO basically said that a kilogram was not a good metric of nutrition. We can be using a kilogram for life cycle assessment, but the function of food was to provide energy and calories and nutrients, not weight, not mass, calories and nutrients. So the FAO is looking for an alternative nutrient functional unit, NFAU they call it, for nutrient relevant life cycle analysis. When you start redoing life cycle analysis, anything else but for a kilogram, it looks like some of the vegetables lose their place. So actually, the FAO proposed multiple units, kilogram, calories, protein, nutrients, and I was actually interested to see that FAO in their 138 page report, which I read, was actually suggesting the use of the nutrient rich score as a potential functional unit for assessment of the environmental impact of foods. And I'm following up on that because, well, it's interesting that we're using various versions of NRF, the 6.0, 9.3, 11.0, more versions that I have done. This was done in the FAO report, chapter six. So, final slide. Innovations in nutrient profiling. It's an evolving field. It is not static. Nutri-score is being revised. The health star rating is being revised. I'm revising the scores. Category specific, yes. Encourage novel ingredients, especially plant proteins and phytonutrients. The data are not there yet, but they will be. And then we want to look at protein quality and nutrients for low and middle income countries. And then of course we want to combine nutrient density metrics with affordability and with carbon cost. So nutrient profiling actually has multiple uses which extend to affordability and also environmental cost of foods. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to finish here. Thank you. Those are my disclosures. I didn't, and no one else had disclosures, but I, I've, been, uh, I've been trained to cite everything from intellectual to financial to familial. So everything is there, and you, I'm happy to go over them with you if you want afterwards. Um, so after 40, I think this, this focus or this example of carbohydrates is an important one because carbohydrates in particular really are under attack. You know, after 40 years of low-fat dietary advice, uh, we see a lot of negative messaging uh, around carbohydrate um, in the media and, that, and the major framers of the news. So some of the major uh, newspapers and conventional media, uh, social media, of course, in particular. And what I've shown here is really a lot of, of books in particular. Uh, popular books which have gotten a lot of traction from you know Atkins which was released in the 70s through to some of the more recent uh, examples you can see there like the big fat surprise by um, Nina Tequoltz. <clears throat> um, and a lot of this recent attention came from a pretty powerful epidemiological analysis just to give this example that drove a lot of recent headlines and when I say recent like pre-COVID headlines back in 2017 um, 
was this analysis by the McMaster group, uh, Salim Youssef and his group, Andrew Mente, of the pure uh, cohort, a very large uh, cohort, 18 countries, over 130,000 individuals, a lot of events, um, a, a cohort that includes um, middle, a, low, a lot of low and middle income countries. Um, so I think being quite relevant uh, to, to many jurisdictions in the world, showing that uh, what you can see here with, with carbohydrate is this increased association uh, with, um, so you have different fatty acids, but looking in red, which is the uh, carbohydrate, showing this increased uh, cardiovascular disease signal and increased mortality uh, signal, which really drove um, a lot of, of the headlines. Now, in the same issue of The Lancet in which this was published and got no media attention whatsoever, the big story was carbohydrates kill, um, was another paper that actually was starting to break it down a little bit and look at markers of carbohydrate quality. And what it showed was that things like legumes and fruit, something we'll, we'll talk a bit about and we've heard about today, the association uh, is, is quite the opposite. You actually see an association with decreased risk as opposed to increased risk with higher intakes of these carbohydrate foods, suggesting that not all carbohydrates are, are equal and we can't really use that brush. And that's something we've, we've certainly learned with fat and protein. Uh, we talk about fat quality, we don't talk so much about fat quantity anymore. Even the nutrients of concern pointed out by Adam, it really focuses on the saturated fat question. And a later analysis of, of PURE um, also further showing another marker of carbohydrate quality, glycemic index. This is my mentor's work, David Jenkins, who invented the concept back in 81, showing uh, increased risk with increased glycemic index of uh, not just uh, CV, events, but CV mortality and all-cause uh, mortality. So that is my segue, sort of set the background into different markers of carbohydrate quality, which I've set up here as four, sort of three positive and one negative, if you like. Um, and a number of scores, and, and, and Adam talked about that and I'll mention it later, have looked at using and leveraging some of these together uh, to create kind of a harmonized score that allows us to identify uh, higher quality carbohydrate foods, but each one in and of, them, of itself has uh, data. And what I wanted to do, and, and I, I'm just doing it for the sake of really demonstrating that we do have evidence, uh, good evidence, the, the highest level evidence we use to inform clinical practice guidelines on public health. This is evidence from, uh, in some cases, uh, not very frequently, we don't have those large cardiovascular outcomes trials or clinical event-driven trials, but we do have uh, large prospective cohort studies of observational, large observational studies are best designed ones, which allow us to adjust for a number of, of confounders and have long longitudinal follow-up to look at outcomes, and then intermediate biomarkers and randomized trials, which give us better protection against bias. So if we just go through each one in turn, and I'm just going to go quickly, and, and these are areas we've contributed some data, so I just wanted uh, to bring them forward. This was something we published in the BMJ just last year. This was an update of, of the glycemic index load work of the of randomized trials, showing you do see improvements in a number of really, uh, I think, clinically important biomarkers like HbA1c, cholesterol, blood pressure, um, and inflammation, CRP. And those are the sort of reductions you get. And just to say the reduction in HbA1c, that would be considered clinically meaningful. Um, so the FDA uh, guidance for new drug development suggests a minimally uh, important difference in HbA1c of 0.3. So that would actually meet FDA uh, um, requirements for new drug development. And when we look at the prospective cohort studies, we don't have those large randomized trials, but the prospective cohort studies, you see a similar story um, where now we have observational studies, but you see an association of higher risk with higher glycemic index and load. And if you look over the global range of, uh, of exposure to GI and GL, you actually see very large um, estimates. And this is for diabetes risk. And we see the same thing, and, and this was work, I should say, as with the previous work that was commissioned to, uh, by the Diabetes Nutrition Study Group to inform the update of our ESD guidelines, which are coming out this year, um, that we did uh, to do that. And this is for cardiovascular disease. We actually see very large risk estimates, which we don't often see um, in epidemiology. <clears throat> so, so good evidence. Um, and with low glycemic index, we also have something in terms of Bradford Hill criteria for causality. We have a biological analogy, which is acrobose, an alpha-glucosidase inhibitor, which effectively converts the diet to a low glycemic index diet. And this uh, has shown evidence of diabetes risk reduction in randomized trials and coronary heart disease risk reduction, or cardiovascular events, I should say, risk reduction uh, from the stopnidum, um, but not in the ACE trial. So if we look at dietary fiber here again, and it'll go a little faster now that you've been sort of, uh, you understand the evidence we're looking at, the prospective cohort evidence again showing higher intakes associated with lower risk 
um, for diabetes and heart disease. We have health claims. I'm giving examples of Canada, US FDA, and the European Food Safety Authority um, for beta glucan uh, for, o, uh, for barley beta glucan We have it. We have it for psyllium for a number of those are just to give you some examples. And this is a, a recent meta-analysis we were part of, uh, which looked at these different viscous fibers. So really, it's the sticky viscous fibers that show the metabolic effects, although the epidemiology shows it for total fiber. Uh, but these are where we have our, a number of our health claims. Um, and that was for, I should say, for uh, HbA1c, and this is for blood pressure. Um, if we look at food-based approaches, and I, just in the interest of time, I don't have time to go through all of these. Uh, they all, all do have very good evidence. I thought I would pick one where we've contributed some evidence, um, which we see, where we see a similar story. But looking at these food-based approaches could be like legumes or pulses, whole grains, fruit and vegetables, and dairy, especially low-fat dairy, where carbohydrates an important component in that. Um, if we look at the legume story where we have contributed some evidence, and this was an updated uh, review, we did an umbrella review uh, published by a very capable student showing reductions in cardiovascular incidence, uh, coronary heart disease incidence, diabetes was a tendency but not significant, and hypertension with, um, and obesity incidence with uh, higher intakes of legume. You can see it there. Uh, we can see with cardiometabolic risk factors, this is from randomized trial evidence, more than 50 trials, more than 1,000 individuals, you see reductions in uh, really our clinical um, intermediate biomarkers that we use in the clinic, so uh, glycemic markers, uh, cholesterol markers, and blood pressure and body weight. Um, and those are the reductions that you would expect to see. And, and you can see there that would be a clinically meaningful reduction again in, in HbA1c, and those would be meet the minimum for reductions we would expect to see in LDL, for example, and, and for body weight uh, and blood pressure. <clears throat> um, the last one is the negative uh, nutrient and, and one we can't avoid, and, and it, it's in a lot of our packaged foods and processed foods, and I think it's an important question for industry, is sugars, and it's in a lot of the nutrient profiling models, such as Adam showed. Here, um, don't have time to go through each one individually, so what I did was to kind of make this story uh, I, I created a heat map, but the takeaway really is when you look at sugars, it really, the food matrix matters and energy matters. And that's, that's what really is the takeaway from our evidence. And if you look here at this heat map of all of our published literature, which I've put together, uh, looking at obesity through to uh, mortality outcomes for CBD, CHD, and stroke, is it's really a story of sugar-sweetened beverages. And I think, you know, Adam showed that even in, in his nutrient profiling models in terms of uh, you know, contributing the least to, to the nutrient density and to, and to nutrients, where we actually see increased signals for risk. The darker, the more the, the stronger the association or the greater the risk estimate, if you like, um, or um, the darker also for reduced risk would be uh, for uh, reductions in disease incidence, and that would be for a number of foods, let's say like fruit, whole grain breakfast, cereals, yogurt. So the story really one is one of matrix here, sugar-sweetened beverages really steals the show and shows the signals, and things like even 100% fruit juice, provided the, the, the uh, dose matters here, the dose is small, level obtainable from fruit, fruit, whole grains, yogurt, even ice cream, can't avoid that, that's the epidemiology, but it, even the ice cream comes out, it's, it's a very similar matrix to yogurt without the, obviously, the fermentation. Um, some sherbets and chocolate, so Nestle would be happy with that, I think, even, even, even chocolate, you're gonna, I'll make friends. Um, so that, that's the observational evidence. If we look at the randomized trial evidence, um, we published a, a series of systematic reviews and analyses here to help uh, inform policy and, and clinical practice guidelines. We also have addition and subtraction in our models. Adam had that in his. Our definitions are similar. So we, did, we pre-specified four trial designs because energy is so important really and to separate uh, from the sugars per se to really get the question, is it the calories or is there something uh, unique or special about the metabolic and endocrine responses related to fructose per se, uh, that may give rise to some of those signals. So to really get at that, we looked at four trial type substitution, which is a, basically a swap one for one under energy match conditions, addition where the sugars are added to a diet providing excess calories, so necessarily a caloric imbalance, subtraction where the sugars are re reduced or calories from sugars are reduced, so subtraction and then ad libitum, which is the free living conditions where there's free consumption. Uh, with guardrails. Here I've just summarized the data. This is data from seven systematic reviews, more than 500 trial comparisons, more than 10,000 individuals. Really the story focuses in terms of harm on addition, so it's really providing the excess calories that we see that, and sugar-sweetened beverages does come out as, as the culprit uh, in most cases. And when we look at 
protective signals, it really relates to fruit, even fruit juice in some cases. Um, and subtraction, it's really the redu reduction in sugar-sweetened beverages that show the improvement in those. Uh, reducing others didn't show that, although we don't have as much evidence. So now I wanted to get in the interesting part of the talk, which is really getting at, now that we've kind of reviewed the data, and we, we can put that aside, and, and I think hopefully you would agree that we do have data to support these different markers, what are some of the unintended consequences, which I think are really the, the focus for industry? Well, I think this very anti-carbohydrate message, I, I think it, it really is leading to uh, changes in intake. And already people weren't meeting uh, the guideline requirements for something like whole grains. And this is just to show you data from uh, Canada, which I think you know, that only 1.5 to about 9% of Canadians are actually meeting the recommendations for whole grains. Um, yet it's, you know, so important um, among um, all those things that we need to, uh, to worry about. Um, and, and so few are, are actually meeting the recommendations. Another uh, issue is that you, we may get a, we're starting to see that I think a bit in the market. Uh, you get the low fat paradigm revisited, so you get more low carb foods, which I think it's great to have selection because there's a lot of people that benefit from a lower carbohydrate diets and we certainly use those in our counseling of patients. But I think it creates the impression that those low carbohydrate foods are somehow better and higher carbohydrate foods are worse. And this is just to give you an example, the low fat sort of foods that we saw on the market uh, that didn't really change the calories, didn't really change a lot of those nutrients of concern other than maybe the fat being a little bit lower. Um, and you, uh, you, we saw the harm that resulted from that or certainly the lack of benefit. And I think the same risk applies here. The other thing too is it can be a conflict with other approaches, not Adam's but other ways of doing nutrient profiling. So if we look at UPFs, like ultra-processed foods, and here's the sort of Montero definition in the FAO uh, document, uh, what you can see here is something like plain steel cutouts, but I've introduced plain cornflakes to set up my, what I'm gonna show you, um, would be considered minimally processed, whereas any breakfast cereal that's sweetened at all would be considered um, ultra-processed. And then unprocessed would also include uh, things like milk, but uh, plant milks would be considered um, processed. And I just want to give you two examples from the clinic. So these are patients that came to me, um, you know, we're counseling on a, a cholesterol-lowering diet, trying to increase those viscous fibers where we have a health claim. Let's, and these are not Nestle products. I've chosen non-Nestle products just to make it interesting. This is Kellogg here. Um, trying to select an all brand buds uh, with psyllium. And I had, a, I had a patient that said, yeah, but I'm really worried, you know, it's, these are highly processed, it's higher in sugar, I'm just gonna stick with my cornflakes. And I had the same example where a patient wanted to eat traditional uh, special K. But I said, yeah, actually, but you've, you've got less sugar, but you've only got a gram of fiber, whereas you've got 13 grams of fiber in your all brand buds with psyllium that will lower your cholesterol, a lower GI, higher GI on the other side. And to give you another example, as we try to transition patients more plant-based, uh, we're trying to increase plant proteins. Same sort of uh, discussion I've had with patients around uh, a cow's milk versus a soy milk, uh, where they're worried that these are very processed and high in sugars. But even, I think something that gets missed is even in a sweetened soy milk, and this is a discussion I have, you could have the unsweetened, of course, it's meant to be isosweet, not isochloric or isoglucidic, because it's matched for sweetness. So you only need five grams of sucrose to get the equivalent of 12 grams of lactose of sweetness. So actually there's less calories and you have potentially a cholesterol lowering plant protein. The path forward, uh, I mean, I think there's been some efforts to try to harmonize some of these and uh, I've been fortunately part of that with an ILC initiative, uh, at the time ILC North America, now IFENS and Barilla uh, in trying to organize you know, some, some conferences around how do we harmonize some of these. We have other uh, papers. I was pretty fortunate to be part of this. This was a Nestle, um, part of, came out of a Nestle uh, symposium at ASN, and we wrote this paper. Uh, it was Vivian Campos and Kim Ann Lay, colleagues and friends, uh, that did this, uh, that really highlighted some of the work that Nestle supported through Darish Mazafarian, looking at different ways can we could put these markers together and create scores, showing that really the best score was just a carbohydrate to fiber marker. And by having that score, you're actually able to predict greater nutrient density, so lower, um, lower uh, sugars, free or added sugars, lower saturated fat, higher fiber, higher protein, higher magnesium, higher potassium, lower sodium, uh, higher zinc, selenium, uh, and so on. So really showing you, you get a, a healthier product in terms of the nutrition profile, greater nutrient density, a more nutrient rich food, if you like. Uh, and I didn't put it in because I thought Adam would cover it, but I'm gonna mention it, and he did mention it in his talk. Uh, Adam has a wonderful paper too, uh, where they took, uh, this is sort of a starting point, but what they added to it also were the nutrients of concerns. So they looked at 
uh, uh, added sugars and fiber, but then they added that the nutrients of concern from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee, which was sodium, pota and uh, potassium, and whole grains. They had a, a four-point and a five-point, also showing it associated really well with his highly correlated with the uh, NRF. Uh, 9.3, I think, was the version you used there. Adam, you've got so many versions, uh, showing a, a very uh, compelling association there with greater uh, nutrient uh, quality and diet quality. And I should say, too, a subsequent follow-up paper, too, from the Mazafarian's group with a group in Sao Paulo showed that it actually also associated with lower risk factors, cardiometabolic risk factors, which I think supports nicely what I showed you in looking at the data that supports each of these measures of carbohydrate quality from the trial evidence to the cohort evidence that I reviewed. We do have, it's more limited, I think, um, depending on where, you know, it's, uh, there's uptake by companies and from, um, and jurisdictions, but you have like something like the whole grain stamp. Certainly most jurisdictions allow as a content claim whole grains, but you also have uh, these sorts of, uh, this stamp, which is in more, on more than 14,000 products in 65 countries. And I think that these can work in concert. Um, we have in much fewer jurisdictions, low glycemic index labeling or symbol programs, um, where um, you, you can also communicate this to consumers, but there, obviously this is much more limited. But I think each of these uh, can help, and I, I, I don't think they have to add uh, confusion. They can just give greater confidence. Uh, one last thing, too, about the, um, just looking at the global burden of disease. This is a really important project funded by the Bill and Melinda, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, because it really asks the question of all the things I need to worry about, and they're up to like 84 different risk factors now, um, including the dietary risk factors, which one's the most important? It allows you to look at that as it uses population tributal risk modeling or uh, tributal fraction modeling that allows us to scale everything. And what you can see is dietary risks are some of the most important and specific ones like whole grains are right in the top 10. And really it's they're, 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 they're the most important are these carbohydrate containing um, if you like risk factors where low intake is a problem. The only one that's high that's a problem is sugar sweetened beverages. And really the conclusion here, which I think is important, is really a focus, I think, on the foods that we're not eating is probably more important than trying to just focus on the sugars, fat, and salt per se. Uh, and I think that's an important finding. We also have dietary patterns which contain a lot of, uh, and really emphasize these carbohydrate quality foods as well, which support um, you know, what we see with these markers of carbohydrate quality. So the conclusions, uh, a focus on positive markers of carbohydrate quality, low GI, I showed you in low GL, fiber, food-based approaches like whole grains, pulses, and fruit. I took you through the example of pulses or legumes. Uh, dietary patterns that include elements of these, so the med, the dash, the portfolio, and others, I think provide robust evidence for benefit. I don't think there's any question there, and that's well supported by the guidelines. A focus on sugars is complicated, though, by energy and food source. The matrix does matter, and the energy uh, does matter. Uh, and I think, importantly, a lot of, I think, processed um, carbohydrate or packaged carbohydrate foods uh, potentially, uh, you know, have that are maybe a little bit higher in sugar may have benefit. And as my mentor, David Jenkins, would say, a little sugar helps the fiber to go down, or a little salt helps the vegetables to go down. It's not about zero, it's about how can we get enough to get the consumers to actually consume these. So things like 100% fruit juice, yogurt, whole grain, uh, high fiber breakfast cereals, and even chocolate. Uh, to avoid confusion, uh, there's a need for harmonization. Uh, and I think the, some of these emerging uh, um, Metrics and approaches like uh, what Adam has done uh, and what I think Dari did and we profiled in our uh, review, um, as well as I think some of the existing framework we have for low GI and whole grains labeling where it's allowed, I think are good pragmatic starting points. Clinical practice guidelines already support this approach. Uh, and I think it's important we really recognize that there is no one best approach or best diet. It's really the most important determinant of benefit is adherence. You gotta get past the mouth. So it's really, I think, trying to work with these combinations of carbohydrate quality. So I don't think it's like anyone has the monopoly, I think, to provide a range of options for consumers uh, and their health goals. Um, so with that, I just want to thank very much uh, for your attention and look forward to the panel discussion. <clears throat>
um, like we, we saw with Adam or with John, we talk about macro and micronutrients. These are going to be a little bit different as this will not be necessary to sustain life. Um, Bioactives, uh, it's really important to mention that they will vary uh, greatly in terms of the chemical structure and as well in the different um, bioactivities and functionalities that have been discovered. Um, I would like to start with this, um, uh, as I do remember that at the beginning when we were uh, knowing about the different um, uh, sites of, of research that Nestle has, they mentioned antinutrients. Well, before food bioactives, they were considered as, an, as antinutrients. So it depends on the side of the coin that we are discussing if they have a pronutritive aspect or they have an antinutrient aspect. So one example is phenolic compounds. We know phenolic compounds, they are well known to have these amazing antioxidant activities. But if we also want to consider phenolics that, uh, for example, are bound to proteins, they can reduce the digestibility of proteins. So in this case, we have a negative impact in terms of protein digestibility. Uh, phytic acid, for example, that's another uh, bioactive compound that is well known that has uh, been looked, uh, that has, for example, the potential to treat uh, different uh, types of cancer cells. But at the same time, it can also reduce the absorption of, of calcium, for example. So plant food bioactive compounds have been really evolving with time. And as we can see in the next slide, uh, we have uh, a huge variety of different types of food bioactives. We have uh, polyphenols, carotenos, uh, glucosinolates, that, for example, is present in, in brassica plants, um, uh, peptides, etc. And as we can see here, the origin of these types of plant bioactives, they can be, if you want to say, uh, released or produced from different types of, of, of processes. So for example, we talk about plants, uh, we can have uh, free phenolics, but for example, we can have phenolics that will be at some point um, bound to fiber and they will be released later in the colon digestion for fermentation, sorry. Or in this case, peptides. We know that peptides will be liberated somehow during digestion if they do reach the target. Um, and we also have, for example, alkaloids that they also have been uh, considered to have this negative aspect in health, but at the same time as well, alkaloids have a lot of um, clinical purposes. And just uh, to mention a few of these examples of food bioactives, as I mentioned, we have a wide diversity of, of these types of bioactives. For example, PUFAS as the doc docoethnoic acid is well known to have uh, positive effects in the vision, in the, in the brain function, for example, as well, there is a lot of uh, in vitro and in vivo work that they have uh, shown that these have anti-inflammatory and anti activity. Um, but then the question is the effective daily dose. So most of those uh, clinical trials have shown that we need to consume at least 250 milligrams of, of this type of PUFAS. But we need to consider as well another aspect that we will discuss later. We have as well, sorry, phytoestrogens. We know that phytoestrogens are many plant-based products, for example, as soya. Uh, polyphenols that in, will be in many different types of fruits and vegetables, but uh, for sure in order to have a positive effect on health, we need to have at least 250 milligrams uh, uh, in terms of consumption. And beta-glucan, um, I know John, he, he talked a bit about uh, beta-glucan in oats, uh, and I will show you an example more in terms of, of the protein uh, of, of oats, but particularly uh, in the case of beta-glucans, we need to consume at least 3,000 milligrams in order to, to see a, a potential health benefit. Um, and in this next slide is really, really interesting. I just want to show you here, um, I know that nowadays we have this boom in terms of plant-based foods, and we have here uh, different uh, plant uh, sources. We have legumes, we have grains, we have pseudo cereals, nuts, etc. And we have different types of food bioactives, uh, phytic acid, saponins, trypsin inhibitors, oxalates, etc. And as we can see here, the amount will be different um, why it's different. Regularly, plant food bioactives are regarded as secondary metabolites. So what does this mean? 
that when we that even the growing conditions, for example, will have an impact on the amount of these type of, of food by actives. Uh, we uh, I will show you later an example, uh, for example, with berries, and we can see how depending on the um, growing conditions, the uh, the amount of, of these uh, food by actives will be completely changed. Uh, and just if, for example, we, if we talk just about one group of food by actives, in this case polyphenols, as we can see here, dietary polyphenols are a wide diverse group of, of, of structures. Um, and depending on the structure, these will also be modified during digestion. And, and we will discuss this because this is so, so really interesting. Uh, there is a lot of, of uh, literature in terms of polyphenols and the uh, beneficial effects that they can have, but we will see that there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, why is necessary to add them into foods? So that's a big question. Uh, you would say, why we just not eat uh, raw foods, in this case, fruits and vegetables? And then we will get uh, these food bioactives from the diet. Well, um, some bioactives, they will be in really, really small quantities in raw foods. So in order to provide a health benefit, we will need to extract them, and then we will need to add them to foods. Um, just, uh, just a typical example is um, isoflavones. Uh, I know that uh, there is a big discussion in terms of isoflavones because uh, there are some um, clinical trials that they have demonstrated that, for example, for, for men it's not good to, to consume these, that they might have a certain type of, of female hormone uh, interactions in the body. Um, well, but the effective dose is 10 times higher than is present in the, in the, in the typical diet. So that's why it, it's really important in this case uh, to extract them and then add them to foods if we want to see like any beneficial effect. Uh, another important application of food bioactive compounds that I will not discuss today, but I just wanted to show it's um, uh, nowadays we have a lot the use of, of byproducts and waste. So we can use different agri-food waste to extract uh, different uh, bioactive compounds. Uh, one of them is, uh, for example, oil seeds uh, after the fat extraction can be used to extract polyphenols, for example, or even to produce uh, um, really interesting protein ingredients that may be used for different, not just uh, techno functionalities, but as well for the potential uh, that this may have in terms of food bioactives. Um, but when we discuss about uh, plant food bioactives, we need to consider that we will have a lot of challenges or barriers in order for them to provide these so-called beneficial effects. The first one is the digestion of plant foods. We need to know that digestion is such a complex process. Um, it, we, we will have uh, different um, um, interpretations, for example, in terms of the metagenome. Uh, it is not the same, uh, for example, if we want to compare if these uh, plant bioactives will be different depending on the ethnicity of, or the populations that we are studying. And then the metabolome. That's why we have uh, the use of different omic technologies that I will mention a bit the importance of using uh, nowadays omic technologies to have a more uh, holistic approach. Um, we also need to consider as well dietary patterns. So it is not the same if we consume, let's say, a uh, rich juice that has uh, rich in polyphenols, that if we will, for example, um, consume it uh, with a piece of meat. So depending on the type of diet that we have, this will have an impact on the absorption and as well as in time to reach the target. Um, genetic polymorphisms, inter-individual variability, and uh, bioavailability we will discuss later. So all these um, different um, terms that we are discussing today will be really important to consider. Just the healthy lifestyle, so it's really important the, say, the sex, the age, physical activity, um, etc. And this will help us in order to understand if these uh, different pl uh, plant food bioactives will really, really have an impact and, and provide uh, a benefit to the consumers. Um, and this is just like an overview of the, the role of the different omic technologies in the study of, of the effects of plant food bioactives. Um, just a, an example I have here, um, resveratrol. I know, I think that everyone has known 
health story about resveratrol, also foraphane from broccoli, for example. Um, we know we need to consider, first of all, the digestion, so that the digestion will have an impact on how these uh, plant food biactives will be released. And then we also need to understand the gut microbiota. We have seen that there is a lot of evidence nowadays that uh, is showing that how the gut microbiota will um, have a real uh, pivotal role in how these food biactives will be released during digestion. And if then as well, they will be used really to provide these, these health benefits. Um, and, and here, um, just to mention particularly, in this section, uh, we have we need to consider um, the, as I mentioned before, lifestyle, uh, age of, of, of the patients, the population, if they, for example, consume any other drugs, health status. Uh, there are some uh, studies where they have, for example, tried to understand the difference of different plant food biactives for control of diabetes. So they tend to, to for example, use different controls that are drugs that are used for the treatment of diabetes. And they have seen that this will have a huge um, uh, response depending on the, on the conditions of the patients. Um, and at the end, uh, how we can use all these different um, omic technologies in order to understand if these plant food biactives will have an impact. Um, just a few of them, I cannot go through all of them, but a few of them, it's uh, how we can use microarray micro um, analysis, um, uh, mass spectroscopy, fish, uh, PCR, etc., that will provide us information particularly on the um, microbiome in different biomarkers. For example, if we are trying to measure anti-inflammatory biomarkers, we can use that, and then um, all this um, metabotyping will be used um, to have a personalized nutrition and at the same time to understand the, the role between microbiota and the metabolism. Um, just here, very, very quick, quickly, just to show you how, um, how um, complex is the viability of polyphenols, for example. We have the consumption of the fruits. It's not the same if we're going to have it in a juice or we will masticate. So food structure is also at the same time very important for the uh, release of these food by actives. And then uh, once we have the absorption, we need to consider all these other uh, aspects that we have discussed uh, previously. Um, this is just an example that I wanted to show you. We have different uh, flavonoids uh, from different human trials, and all of them were normalized to 50 milligrams in dose. Um, and uh, we, we can see here that the maximal concentration is different, but something that I really want to highlight from these slides is that it's really difficult to compare if you try to compare all these studies in terms of uh, bioavailability of polyphenols, for example, they have used different um, types of conditions in terms of the, of the population they have selected. So that's why it's really, really difficult to compare if they might have an impact or not. This is just an example as well I want to, sh to show with you. We wanted to compare wild blackberry against commercial bla blackberry. We subjected them to an in vitro digestion. We took samples at different stages of digestion, and we wanted to understand how this will uh, change. You might not see it really clearly here, but at the bottom, uh, we can see clearly that how, um, first of all, we can see from the slide that um, the polyphenols will be completely different from the wild berry against the commercial one. Um, at the same time, we also see that there is a biotransformation of these polyphenols in terms uh, during digestion. So we will find different uh, uh, products of the metabolism of the polyphenols. And here, just to show you as well how the um, antioxidant activity is changed and it's uh, somewhat enhanced after digestion. So there is potential um, and positivity that this might have uh, an impact on health. This, is, uh, this was with oats. Um, just very quickly, because I'm running out of time, we wanted to check the, the, the oat proteins, if they might have an impact. But we know that oat is not consumed raw. So we subjected uh, oat protein to heating to boiling. Uh, like we would consume porridge. 
Um, and we can see here that uh, particularly we saw uh, that uh, the bioactivity of the consumption of oat do have a good profile in terms of uh, antioxidant biomarkers. So that was a really interesting as well. We measure the PDCAS value, the per values of the protein, and as we were expected, it was increased due to the, to the processing. Just This is just to mention that there are a few great projects from the European Union that have been done for testing the efficacy of the bioactive compounds. And just to finish, uh, I will just finish with this uh, Paul's example. We did this uh, with uh, diet, uh, with bean diet, uh, and we wanted to check if there was like any impact in terms of, of uh, particularly on the microbiota. And as we can see here, the, the first, the, this was the first discovery. We saw that there is a wide diversity in terms of the microbiota between the basal diet against the bean diet, which was really, really interesting. We also see that in terms of the um, microbiota, there is a lot of differences between them, um, particularly uh, th these ones that we have, the arrows, are really interested because we have seen that particularly these have been um, um, linked to uh, benefits to the host. And we see particularly uh, Ruminococcus nevus that has been uh, related to anti-inflammatory diseases was uh, reduced after the consumption of beans. This is just some a few um, um, sure fat acids that we were uh, interested in to measure because we know that when all these um, um, non-soluble uh, oligosaccharides reach the colon, they will be liberated. Um, and we saw that particularly we have a good uh, uh, production of these types of sure fatty acid uh, chains. Um, and here, just to finish, uh, we can see here a more uh, wider aspect of how the microbiota was changed after the consumption of beans. So we can really assume that the consumption of, of pulses has a good impact on, on, the, on the health. And just as conclusions, uh, we need to use omic te technologies um, to tackle all these great uh, research challenges. Um, in order to understand how these modifications are really related uh, to different uh, populations, we need to have a more holistic approach. Um, we need to understand that these top-down um, approaches are really needed um, if we want to really verify the potential or positive benefit of any food uh, by active. And for that, we need to integrate uh, microbiome, uh, nutrigenomics, metabolomics, proteomics, etc., to have a, a better picture of how these um, may interact, even with other compounds like fiber or proteins, etc. Um, and just to mention that the microbiome, that it was really interesting uh, when we went to see uh, all the research that has been done, that it's been doing right now in, in, in the SLE, the microbiome has a huge impact on how this will be uh, digested, but as well if this will be released, and somehow, if at some point, they really will reach the target and produce a bioactive effect. And just to thank my group, because for sure, I wouldn't be able to do all this uh, research without a group of, of, of students of great uh, younger minds. So thank you very much.